Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Michael Frondi here, and welcome to this week's episode of the Stay Human Podcast. I have a super, super uh, amazing person who I admire a ton, whose music I love. I love his band, and I love what he does as the co-executive director of Reverb. And for those of you who don't know, um, Adam... Gardner is his name. He's rallied his fellow musicians and their millions of fans to take action towards a better future for people and the planet at concerts and beyond. And Reverb partners with major musicians like Billie Eilish, Dave Matthews Band, Jack Johnson, Harry Styles, Fleetwood Mac, Dead and Company, John Mayer, Pink, Maroon 5. I mean, Man, if James Brown was alive, I bet he'd be working with James Brown and uh, empowering fans to take action for people and the planet. Since 2004, Reverb's programs and touring staff have been folded into 300 plus major tours, festivals, and venues, eliminating the use of over 3 million single use plastic water bottles, keeping over 180,000 metric tons of CO2 from the air, um, supporting the creation of over 100 climate change fighting projects around the world and over 4,200 environmental groups across the country. So, man, that's a lot of stuff you've been doing, bro. <laughs> been busy. Been doing <laughs> you've been keeping busy. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the show. This is the great Adam Gardner from Guster. And Adam, man, I want to get into all this stuff because it's near and dear to my heart. And, and I just... I just admire you, man. You're like one of the, I got to say, you're one of the coolest people on the planet and the coolest people in music. Um, And before we do that, you know, on this show, I always like to find out where people are from. So just tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, where did you grow up and what was your family like? Yeah, I grew up in New Jersey, which is kind of an unlikely You know, people look at environmentalism and go, a Jersey boy doing this stuff? (laughs) That's kind of weird. I, I live in Maine now, um, and I love that. But it's interesting enough, you know, like a lot of people who aren't familiar with the state, there are, there are beautiful parts of the state. Oh, yeah. I was lucky absolutely. enough to grow up in a very wooded area. In fact, my immediate surroundings here in Maine aren't really that different than what I grew up with as a kid. And, and I have kids mm. of my own now. And I remember growing up running around in the woods. You know, I, I actually had, a, I grew up in a very small town. I, you know, I went to a K through eight elementary school that had a class size of 32 kids for the whole grade like so it's pretty small there are more horse trails than roads we didn't have a proper traffic light when i was growing up there was just a blinker at kind of the main thing it was it almost (laughs) it almost harkened to a different time um when i look back at it of course now it's been overdeveloped (laughs) unfortunately but um yeah i mean i i think you know what was the name of your town it was called new vernon new jersey okay yeah. So it was weird. It was like this little kind of oasis. Of course, now I know a little bit more about the context of it and why it was prote- protected uh, as, as a wooded area. But the history of it, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a farm area. You know, the Garden yeah. State is, isn't a misnomer everywhere. You know, when yeah. people think of Jersey, they think of the, the, you know, the Turnpike or the Garden State Partway. But there's actually a lot of beautiful um, wooded and, and farmland in, in yeah. kind of northern central Jersey. And that's where I, I came from. Nice. And what did your parents do? My dad was a doctor um, and my mom was a public health nurse. So very uh-huh. medical family. Um, and I have two older sisters. I was kind of a, a surprise, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have two two older sisters that are 13 months apart. So they're very close in age. And then I came six, five years later. Okay. So yeah, I was like, surprise, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so they were... I, you know, I think people always, I think there's actually been studies that say people who have older sisters end up being happier. Um, and because I think the older siblings being female, I remember kind of, especially because I was so far in age from them. I remember as a a little boy calling my mom, my mom, then I had my little mom and then my littlest mom. So I felt very nurtured. I felt a lot of female energy in the home. My dad was a very busy doctor. He was around but he was working a lot so i remember lots mm-hmm. of times he would come home join us for dinner maybe we'd play a little bit of you know whatever games we could play together and then he'd go back out to the hospital he was a he's a neurosurgeon so he had he was constantly working he worked at three different hospitals and you know if you have to if, if you have to see my dad you're not in good shape so uh yeah. he was out there 
fighting his own fight to sit, keep people alive. Wow. And so when you were a kid, what's, what's the earliest thing that you remember growing up there in New Vernon? Hmm, in the weird. woods for me it really is like it's there's a little there's a little creek behind our house and i remember kind of just digging around in there it was really teeny and it maybe maybe on a if it had just rained maybe it was two and a half feet deep you know yeah so it was safe and that, that, therefore i had total freedom to just run around the woods and they, we had little crayfish in there and even the beds of the river had um it was clay that i remember like molding into little like figurines and stuff and so I, right from an early age i was just in the woods, everything was micro. I wanted to look at all the little bugs and the stuff on the mm. ground. And so my, I, I have very fond memories of that and just feeling free. And I, you know, there are other, there are some other neighborhood kids and we'd go exploring is what we'd call it. And we'd follow yeah. the river to the lake and we'd follow the river the other way to the, to where uh, it sprung out of the earth. And so, yeah, it, it I don't, I, I've never really thought about it that way, but I guess now that we're here and I'm talking to you about it and we're kind of, you just laid out all yeah. that environmental stuff. I was like, huh, maybe that is how that started to click in right away. So, well, well, did your parents have any kind of environmental consciousness? Was that part of your upbringing or? I don't, you know, not aggressively. I mean, recycling was always a thing. And I was, you know, I was, I did the Cub Scouts and I remember, you know, we had to, part of our work was to help with the recycling. I think back then, like we were crushing glass and stuff, which is of course mm -hmm. ridiculous. You think about a bunch of young kids, like <laughs> yeah. smashing bottles and stuff. With, <laughs> With sledgehammers and stuff, I was like, hmm, I don't think we had safety goggles on here. It was a different age. It was a different time. <laughs> As a parent, reminds me of I look back and go, hmm. <laughs> reminds me of when I was a bar back. I used to get, I used to get off on that at the end of work. I'd get all my frustrations out by dumping huge bins of glass into other bins of glass. You know, um, so and your mom, what what was what was she like in your life? She was very present. She, you know, I think she came from that generation where love was expressed by doing and she mm. was always there i can't think of one sporting event or musical concert or anything that i mm -hmm. did that she was not there um yeah. and just always always had my back so that when i think of my mom especially when i was a boy she i'm fortunate enough that they're, they're both 80 and they're both alive um mm. and healthy and, and doing well which is amazing so i feel mm. very fortunate there when i think about who they were to me when I, you know, was growing up. Yeah, she was just a badass, always there, worked her butt off, but also made sure that her family was number one priority and she would always work her schedule so we, she was there. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, she, her mother, not to get too deep into this, but her mother wasn't, her mother had mental illness. Mm -hmm. And I think she fought against, you know, I think she wanted to give us what she didn't have. And I, I think mm -hmm. every good parent wants that for their kids. And yeah. uh, she did it. Yeah. So as, as a kid growing up, um, was music a part of your life and in, in your household? Yeah. And that's where my father came in. He was, he was a musical guy. He was very, he's, you know, a brilliant neurosurgeon, Harvard educated guy. Like he's like, yeah. no, no joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so that was intimidating because I'm, you know, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm no dummy, but I'm definitely not. I wasn't like academics were not like top priority for me. I, I kind of yeah. did as well as I could to not get in trouble by anybody, you know, like okay, yeah. just kind of duck and get by and and do the good work. But you know, I wasn't. I didn't get passionate about academics until college, until I really okay. found um, subjects that really got me excited. And, and for did me, you that, ever butt heads with your dad because of that? No, actually, it's funny. My, so, no, he was very cool. It's just the, it just felt like a lot to live up to, mm. given all that he has accomplished and, and just who he is. Um, mm. At the same time, he brought music. He was a pianist. Um, and so music was always in, in the house. He would play piano. My sister sang and played piano as well, mm. flute. And so music was always there. And uh, I guess I, for me, it was one of those things where I was like forced to take piano lessons. You know, I didn't yeah. really want to, um, <laughs> but boy, am I glad that I did. Uh, Cause that gave me the foundation to it. And then, you know, kind of the usual school thing, like, Oh, you have to choose an instrument for marching band. And so what's it going to be? So I played trumpet. Um, and so learned how to sight read a little bit more that way. 
Um, and then that was kind of the end of my formal education. I picked up, then I picked up a guitar. Then I think a buddy and I were like, wouldn't it be cool if we had electric guitars? And we didn't know anything about how to play them, <laughs> but we found some, like there's a, you know, a music store nearby that was renting, you know, little gorilla 10 watt amps and, and yeah. whatever, you know, cheapo guitars for, you know, it was like, you know, whatever it was, it's like 20 bucks a month. Like, let's just rent them and we'll figure it out later. And that's what we did. And, uh, you know, we went down in the basement and made a bunch of noise and loved it. Yeah. Um, so I think it was really from that point where I got very excited. It was like, it wasn't music became something I wanted to do as something I had to versus something I had to do. And how old were you at that point when you started playing electric guitar? That was like seventh or eighth grade. So, okay. Yeah. So yeah, you're 11th. still like, you're still like forming your, you know, you're going through puberty and all that stuff. Tell me about that. What was that part of your life? Like, what were the challenges for you? Um, you know, as that age of a kid and, you know, you're going up in a small community and, you know, your, your, your family's really educated and you're like down in the basement being a rock star, you know, like, <laughs> and what was it like in, in the community with other, uh, other people? And what, what were the hardest parts of, of being that age? You know, I think for me, the hardest part was, I mean, I honestly, I was very fortunate. Like I didn't, you know, I, I'm, you know, I've got a daughter who's 12, so she's right in the thick of all of that yeah. right now. Oh, like God. all that, all that's happening, all, ah. the cha- all the changes are going on. She's doing <laughs> great. She's doing great. But I, you know, I'm just aware of like, oh, right. Like I actually, honestly, I feel very lucky. I, I, I went through puberty very young um, and not in a scary way because I came from a medical family. It wasn't like, what's going on in my body? Like I understood yeah. and. I don't really remember getting the talk, but I knew anyway. And, and yeah. so it must have happened. It just wasn't traumatic enough for me to remember yeah. it happening. <laughs> um, so I feel very lucky that way. And I was, you know, sports were a big part of what I was doing. So, mm-hmm. and because I, I shot up before everybody, I was faster and stronger and bigger than everyone. So yeah, I was, I felt very comfortable in my own skin. It actually led to a lot of really positive experiences and probably allowed me to feel confident enough to be like, yeah, I'm going to be a musician and try to be, you know, do it for a living. Like that, that takes a a certain amount of a level of belief in yourself that I don't know if I would have had if I didn't actually just go through all those changes that time in a smooth and early fashion. Now, of course, I became a very lazy athlete because I didn't learn any skills (laughs) because I was because I was bigger and faster than everybody at the time. But then once everybody caught up, I was very average at sports. (laughs) Yeah, but but it was enough to by then it was too late. I would already thought well of myself (laughs) in a good way. Um, I wasn't delusional, but I felt confident. Yeah. And what was it about music, though, that that drew you in? What was the thing? I mean, it's one thing I, I know that feeling of like you, you get down in your your space or your garage or your rehearsal room and you turn the amps up way too loud. And there's certainly like there's a power to it. There's a feeling and vibration. And like I strike the chord and round this crank comes out of it. And and then you and then at some point you go, well, what am I going to do with this? You know, like, what is it? How, how do I shape this into something that's, that's worthy of other, maybe of other people hearing it or, or is worthy of my emotions being put into it my thoughts, my feelings, my ideas about myself and about the world. So how did that come to be? Yeah. So like very quickly, like, you know, I think it's a, fairly maybe it's not i think it's a fairly standard garage band story where it's like well the second i could play three chords i learned yeah. a bunch of other <laughs> songs because that you know three chords gets you a lot of the rock catalog <laughs> yeah oh it all of us and opens up to you and uh you know i had another buddy that i was you know playing sports with and and uh was learning like did the similar thing that i did with guitar but with the drum set it's like i'll bring yeah. the drums over and we just started jamming like like literally like the second I learned that third chord, we were trying to play Beatles songs and whatever we could yeah. figure out. Um, I did have a guitar teacher that I, that I only took for only a couple of years, but the biggest takeaway from that was like using your ear and learning, like mm-hmm. when you hear the song, how to figure out to, tr- you know, to translate that to an instrument and learn how to um, play that song that you love and are listening to. So for me, yeah. again, with my older sisters, I remember before even picking up an instrument, just listening to their records in the basement, you know, and, and mm. some of the early records that turned me on to music. And it was really through a sonic place. Like I was like, God, that sounds 
so cool mm. was uh, that first Cars record. And I was like, man, the way those oh, guitars God. sound, how do they? I still really don't know how they got those set tones. No, and and the synthesizers like, too, and just the dr the drums, how how it all was so metronomic. You know, it was so like it sounded like it's done with with drum machines but it wasn't you know it was drum yeah and yet still had emotion and and yeah. you know, like a cool swagger and like all this stuff yeah. that was just like i lo i don't know why i like this but i do and, love those uh, records but yeah. it really was like an oral experience like just listening and hearing it made me excited yeah. um and so it was a combination of that initial like wow i like music to then, yeah. oh, I can play three songs and kind of, oh, the drum set together with my buddy. And then, you know, we brought another friend over who could play piano and he had a keyboard and we plugged in and just started very quickly figuring stuff out. And I just remember like sitting in like social studies class, like working out signal chain and stuff, being like, how are we going to get a PA to put out the blah, blah, blah. And like, we're, you know, we're right. going to go play the battle of the bands and like we need to figure out like, you know, all the gear stuff. I was like doing stage plots and stuff in my notebooks during school. Um, so I just got very, into the, the all of it from the logistics yeah. of it to the playing to the learning kind of got an education with because thank god that the teacher who taught me like how to listen with my ear and translate that to my fingers yeah just got an education together with my two other bandmates we played in a band for five years together from like eighth grade through actually it was longer than that so yeah eighth grade through senior year uh, yeah. of high school and just went through like the classic rock catalog and, and played all those songs and really studied them and got inside every little solo and every little chord change. And Wow. Did you guys write any of your own tunes or was it just covers? We just were starting to write a couple of our own tunes. I mean, this is where Growing Up in New Jersey played a role. Like it was just, there wasn't a lot, there, were, there weren't a lot of avenues for original music in my immediate area, you know. Yeah. Without, I, you know, again, we weren't in a place where I was, you know, you, the driving age there was 17. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like we were able to go, all right, let's go into the city and make something happen. It was like, no, nah. yeah. we were just in our immediate area. So it was really just about, you know, battle of the bands and stuff like that and, and yeah. learning covers. So we, we wrote a couple songs, you know, they were, as you would imagine, if yeah. the first songs are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, the real songwriting thing didn't happen until college. So when tell me about that. Where did you go to, to school? I uh, went to Tufts University outside of Boston. Sure. And um, and that's where I met Ryan O'Brien from Guster. Like literally, we there's there's orientation and then a week or two before the actual orientation where everybody goes to show up at school is wilderness orientation. And I signed up for that and I met Ryan and Brian in the woods in New Hampshire um, wow. while we were just doing, a, you know, some hiking and camping before school started. And wow. met them, kind of became friends with them. Our dorms were kind of near each other. We were friends first. And then it was one of those like, oh, you play guitar and sing. Yeah, oh, yeah I played in a band in high school too. Oh, maybe we should jam. But we didn't, we came from different musical backgrounds and didn't know any songs in common. So yeah. we started writing. And that was kind of how that started, like right away, freshman year in college. Wow. Wow. And so at that time, what were you guys writing about or, or was were you all writing the lyrics together or was it kind of i got an idea for a song and or i wrote the whole song and bring it to the band or how was it working I'm trying to remember exactly how it went down but I, I think it was it it was as it mostly is now where we sit around and write collaboratively um yeah. lyrics in the beginning were <laughs> you know, insufferable. Yeah. <laughs> if I look back now, and a lot of those lyrics are on our first record. You know, that yeah. first album we made in college, we were, you know, juniors when that record was released, you know? Yeah. Um, and we just put it out on vinyl like last week. <laughs> wow. But um, yeah, I think we were going through, you know, it was very collegiate as far as the lyric yeah. uh, themes, the lyrical themes. Yeah. And I was, you know, one of the songs that I'm thinking of, which is a ridiculous title, it's called Happy Frappy. And it was very, you know, I was taking a philosophy class and I was thinking about sociology and psychology, which were, I was a psych major. And um, so it was a lot of those, you know, the messages were nice. You know, the execution was, we were beginners, you know? Yeah. And it's always interesting having something like that. It's, you know, it's almost like looking at, at pictures of yourself when you were going through puberty, sometimes listening to those early records, you're like, that was a snapshot in time. We're not there now, yeah. I, you yeah. know, and trying not to, <laughs> you can hear that I'm like trying to make excuses and caveats about that music, but it's, it was for what, where we were and, and for, 
you know, a bunch of kids that got together, try to make some music together for the first time. I'm, I'm yeah. actually proud of that. So I, I need to, I need to remember to be proud. <laughs> Um, it's kind of like a, a tattoo, you know, that you've had like, a, uh, my first tattoo, you know, my buddy did it, you know, but it's, 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 it's there and it's, it's me and it's, uh, you know, it's not the best tattoo <laughs> artistically, but, uh, it, it, it does mark a time period. And how, actually, how did the name Guster come to be? Well, we were Gus first. Um, and I have no, I mean, it was one of those, again, we never thought we were and at first, we were just buddies playing music together. Right. And yeah. we just need to come up with the name just to put on a flyer that we could hang on the cork boards around yeah. college campuses. So yeah, we're playing at the coffee house, you know, whatever it yeah. was. So I don't know. There were three members, three letters. It was Gus. Um, okay. and then, so we did, we, you know, when we sold a bunch of record, we, we played in Harvard square, you know, we busked on the streets um which was actually really uh, interesting education in, in and of itself like how do you capture people's attention when they're walking by they're not there to see you they're not there to even see music they're shopping in harvard square or whatever they're doing how yeah. do you draw them in and keep them there and hold their attention and yeah that was a really interesting how do you entertain yeah yeah it was an interesting kind of again education through doing <laughs> mm -hmm. um but through that, you know, weirdly, you know, we play like Head of the Charles where all these colleges and all these college kids from all over would come in. And so we started becoming this kind of underground. Again, this is pre-internet, pre, -internet, pre yeah. uh, you know, making an out, making a CD was like, oh, my God, you can make a CD. Of course, now anyone can make anything in their bedroom at any time. Yeah. At that time, it was like we went to a real studio. We had to spend real money. It was I remember. Yeah. Us, I remember the producer telling us what it was going to cost. And we we're like, oh my God, this is never going to happen, you know? Yeah. But then we just played enough in Harvard Square and put out our, you know, we had a cassette tape. We sold those for five bucks out of our guitar, like on the streets. And we sold a bunch of them. Um, and same thing with our CD. Like before we graduated, I think we sold like 50,000 albums out wow. of our backpacks, basically. Wow. Um and just through like playing colleges and and uh, playing in Harvard Square and playing in our own school, and then we kind of created this rep program. Where uh, do you remember um, the Aware compilations? Yeah, yeah. So we were part of that. I don't know if you were part of that or not, but you certainly were like in that same like yeah. sphere. Yeah. And they just had. There's a band called Jacko Pierce. I don't know if you remember them. No, I don't they're know. an acoustic duo from Dallas, and. Uh, they had, they were very smart about before they even came to Boston, they were friends with Ryan. Ryan grew up in Texas and they were really smart. Like, Oh, you like my band and your friends are into, into our music. Here's 10 CDs, just sell them. And when you do give us the money and they're oh, like, yeah. well, that's interesting. And we started doing this, what we called a rep program where fans, if they liked us and they, you know, wrote to us, email existed then at least. Um, yeah. We're like, hey, if you want to sell 10 CDs, we'll just mail them to you. We like packed them up in like cereal boxes and like yeah. drew some little, you know, drawings and said thanks. And we actually like made them little rep badges where we'd give them rep names and, and like some weird drawing and, and off they went. It was a, you know, it was an honor system and mostly worked. And, but what really worked is that it was a distribution system. Yeah. <laughs> At the a time. Music got the, out there. People heard it. Yeah. Yeah. And we, through that, we distributed a bunch of CDs and, and, yeah. and had a nice core fan base of these reps that were like passionate about what we were doing. Um, so we did that for a long time and had thousands of reps. Um, at what, at what point did, you know, th this idea like, okay, we're, we're getting going, we're, we're touring, we're selling some records, we're getting, you know, a building an audience. And at what point did you start to feel like, Hmm, maybe there's something more to this. Maybe there's, maybe there's a message that, that I can be delivering or the band can be delivering, or there's a partnerships we could create with other bands. Like how did that idea that eventually led to starting reverb, um, enter into it all? I think it was, you know, I think maybe there was like one too many emails asking about like what product I put in my hair or what jeans I was wearing <laughs> or something like that. I was like, this is, there's got to be an, a more elevated dialogue here. This isn't this isn't satisfying at all, and and it's awesome that people are interested in wanting to connect. So, is there a way that we can connect on a level that is more meaningful? 
Um, yeah. And I think at the same time, you know, so at Tufts, you know, I met Ryan and Brian freshman year. And then my sophomore year, I met my now wife, Lauren, who is uh-huh. the co-executive director of Reverb and co-founder of it. Really, she founded Reverb. I'm the co-founder. She's the pilot. I'm yeah. the co-pilot. Um, and, uh, you know, she came from the environmental world. She worked for Rainforest Action Network, where she met you at, at a ruckus event uh, years ago. And she was in San Francisco at the end of the 90s. Um, and so for her, she was always the environmentalist. Um, and I was always the musician. Um, and then when I, we started dating and living together and falling in love and, and we moved in and together. And that's when I think seeing how she lived and wanting to, <laughs> to be in her good graces and to you know, <laughs> want her to love me back. <laughs> I was like, I should probably, and, and also just made a lot, honestly, it also just made a lot of sense. Like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's common sense. Yeah. We shouldn't be just shitting where we eat. Um, yeah. and, and it doesn't make sense to to pollute our immediate surroundings and poison our air, soil and, and food systems and, and, yeah. and water. And so it, it just made sense to me. And then I, you know, go up back out on tour and go, Oh my God, this is all, this all flies in the face of everything I'm doing at home. All the plastic waste on the ground, all the, you know, the generator and the bus never stopping, mm-hmm. just everything being so disposable in nature when it comes to live music and all the, you know, thousands of people driving from wherever to get to the show every night. It just was like, it, once you started looking through that lens, it just became literally eye opening, right? And I was just like, oh my mm-hmm. God. Um, and at the time we were touring with, you know, we were opening for bands like Maroon 5 and Dave Matthews Band, and a lot of the bands you mentioned at the beginning of the show mm-hmm. that now work with Reverb. We, you know, we were all feeling similarly like, God, this is a shame. This, isn't, this doesn't represent who we are. Um, yet, it is unfortunately a huge mm-hmm. part of what we do. Um, how do we, you know, and it kind of started with that, like, damn, this sucks. And then I think I just complained to Lauren one too many times after coming home from a tour. I'm like, God, it's just a, it's a shit show out there. Yeah. And she's like, well, stop shrugging your shoulders at each other. You're talking to other artists that feel the same. You have the ability to do something about it, come together. And at the same time, she was, when she was working at Rainforest Action Network, meeting folks like you, and Bonnie Raitt and Dave Matthews, seeing how when musicians get behind causes, it seriously amplifies the public's interest and engagement in those causes. Yeah. So I think, and she was always a pop kid. Like she, you know, her interest was bringing environmentalism to the mainstream. Because yeah. I think, you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, green was just a color. Sustainability mm-hmm. wasn't really even a, a common word. Um, yeah. Environmentalism was was for a certain like hippies. group of it yeah, for it, was hippies, for, it was for like hippie yeah. crunchy people. That's yeah, it, yeah, and it yeah. was not at all mainstream. And so she was interested in bringing it mainstream. I was interested in talking to mainstream artists in cleaning up our own act. And she was like, yeah. "Cool, let's not only you know help transform music and making it more sustainable." but let's use music as this platform to engage all your fans and all the artist fans to take action and get into this. Like music is such a huge cultural driver. How do we shift culture with music and musicians that care uh, to save our own asses effectively? <laughs> you yeah. know, it's describe yeah. how, describe how reverb works like in a practical sense. Cause we, I mean, we've had reverb out on our tours, but just for some people who never knew about reverb, describe how like, you know, a band approaches you or you approach a band and say, hey, you guys want to be involved in this? And then what does Reverb do on in terms of the tour? And and uh, Yeah, and I mean, touring is probably the easiest way to think about it. We do more than tours too, but certainly started there and it is still the, a, a huge core of what we are and do. So a lot of it is, is, logi- a lot of it is logistics, right? There's, there's mm-hmm. this huge divide between what an artist wants to have happen and what actually happens. And so a lot yeah. of what we are and do is just helping cross that chasm between intentions and actions. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, we will fold a, a member of our team into the touring crew, just like a guitar tech or sound guy um, mm-hmm. to handle a lot of the stuff on the ground that everyone's, you know, plates are too full to handle out on the road already. Everyone, all the crew folks out there on, on the tour, are very focused on pulling off the show smoothly. And that's, mm-hmm. that's right. Um, but therefore we, we, we realized like the easiest thing to do is just insert one of our staff into the team to, to like be dedicated to making the tours more sustainable. And so, and then we have the office here in, in Portland, Maine, 
that handles all the logistics and setup ahead of time. So we have kind of, we call it like kind of like mission control and major Tom. Uh, and uh, although actually most of our onsite coordinators are female, so we, we got to come up with a better name than Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the idea is whether that's sourcing food for caterers within X miles from local and organic family farmers, biodiesel for the buses and trucks will come in and actually coordinate wet hosings uh, at the venues to fill up. Um, you know, setting up programs. So it's, there's kind of two things, right? Like looking at the tour itself and the concerts and how do we reduce waste and carbon footprints mm -hmm. and, and all the negative impacts that the, the events themselves hold. And then there's the other side of, and then how do we engage fans at the concerts? We set up the eco village and bring in local and national nonprofit groups. We have volunteers across the country now, thousands of them that we can bring in and coordinate. So somebody at the reverb office, for example, will at, for every show on a tour, we're like, cool, we need 15 volunteers uh, every night in each market. Let's rally them, get them signed up, make sure they're vetted and know what they're doing. Um, yeah. So it's it's a long list of things that we do to make the tour more sustainable, looking at food, looking at plastic waste. We have our own water stations that we'll set up, providing free filtered water stations from municipal sources at the venue. Um, and you know, and a, we have a partnership with Nalgene called Rock and Refill that you talked about where we eliminated so far over 3 million single-use water bottles at the yeah. concerts, never mind the fact that they take home a reusable water bottle and hopefully are using that moving forward. You know, that's certainly the idea. And, and, and from what we can qualitatively um, understand, that, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. So it's, it's a long list and there's no silver bullet. It's kind of this wedge theory of like, you got to just do every little thing just that take you them can, off but it's not all yeah. or nothing either. Right. Like I think yeah. it's a really important philosophical approach for us, whether they're, you're an artist or, or an industry leader or a fan, like we're not asking you to do everything. We just asking you to start doing things because a few people doing everything is not going to add up to everybody doing a few things. Mm -hmm. and, you and know, that's the key. You, you mentioned how many kids do you have? Uh, two. Okay. So as a parent, you know, um, I look at this next generation of, of, of kids and environmentalism is in their blood. They are so concerned about their lives, their, their, their planet. They're concerned about, um, you know, social consciousness and in, in terms of, race, sexuality, gender, so many things that um, previous generations have really struggled with. They are loud and, and proud about, about vocalizing. Um, and at the same time, they are subject to the pressures of social media and of comparing themselves to other kids. How, as a parent, do you approach the idea of activism for your kid within this greater, you know, bubble of, man, if I post this thing about, you know, Greta Thunberg, now I've got like a hundred, you know, anti, you know, eco people in my feed, you know, and, and, and trying to beat up a 12 year old, you know? So how, I mean, I don't even know if you're there that yet with your, with your kids, but talk to me about it. What, what, what do you think you're going to do? How are you going to, that's it. Yeah, we're not. So we're on the precipice of all of that with our kids. They we they don't have social media accounts right now. Yeah. Um, and obviously, during the pandemic, we're struggling a lot with screen time. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you know, I think as far as their activism in and of itself, they obviously know what their parents are doing on a daily level, especially now that we're all under, you know, all working together, <laughs> like our office is mm -hmm. at home and so is their school. We're all yeah. in the same place doing our stuff. And so they, they, they really know what we're up to more, even more than ever. It's like a, a permanent, like bring your kids to, to work day. <laughs> yeah. um, so they see that and they know that and they, they're, they're thoughtful of it. They're obviously very different. They, they're very different kids. So I have a 12 year old daughter and a 10 year old son and they're, they're, they're amazing. And they're so, what is amazing to me is how different they are. It's like, you grew up in the same house, you grew up in the same context, like this nature versus nurture <laughs> thing. It's like, wow, nature is playing a serious role here. It's not all just nurture because they've had very similar upbringings. Yeah. Um, there's different people. And uh, so my son 
thinks in big, big terms. And, and, you know, I don't, we were lying in bed. He's 10. We were lying in bed and he was asking me about the Cold War. <laughs> wow. like, it was like heavy. It's like, how do I do this for a 10 year old? How do I explain? Like, he's like, why would we be pointing missiles at each other like that? Like when there's a no, there's a no, clearly no win situation there. And I was like, yeah, you get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think the hardest part for him is, you know, how to keep him positive about humanity and humans yeah. uh, because yeah. he sees like, this doesn't make any sense. Why are we mm -hmm. killing ourselves? Why like, through war, through, through environmental destruction? Like, why would we do that? I don't, we should be smarter than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard to disagree with that. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I say, I know. And that's why, you know, that's why, you know, mommy and I are doing what we're doing in the environmental front to like, you know, there are, you know, humans are, are, are beautiful and wonderful and flawed and we're all of it. We're complex. <laughs> um, yeah. and that's hard to t talk to a 10 year old about. It's hard to, to even reconcile it in my 47 year old self. Like, how does this work? Yeah. You know, why is this working this way? Um, so yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, we haven't come across the social media side of that where the haters start coming when you're, you know, w when you want to put yourself out there and it's, you know, Honestly, we have to talk, we talk to artists about that too. I mean, I'm sure you, you know, as an outspoken musician on, on social and environmental issues, you get it all the time, right? The whole like, yeah. hey, shut up and sing, yeah. which I think is like the, the worst yeah. comment. Cause it's like, what am I just a clown to you? Like I'm a human. Yeah. And, 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 you know, uh, Katie Tunstall said something wonderful, like, uh, wonderful about that comment and she says i just tell them if you if, if you want it, you're on the wrong platform this is yeah. this is you know if i'm on twitter you're not hearing my music here go to spotify you're on the wrong yeah. platform if you just want me for my music go to my music that's not what this yeah. is yeah um which i thought was an interesting retort that's you know, a great just, take yeah yeah you know? um but yeah i mean you obviously can't i don't know I'd be interested to hear what, what your thoughts on this too, but you know, you have to just kind of shut out that noise. You know, it's really hard. I've, I have, I have three sons and they're all kind of different eras almost because they're one's 33, one's 22 and one's two. Wow. And, um, so the 33 year old grew up in a time of basically email and there started to be some, you know, chat groups or whatever. And then my, my second son, he grew up just as like, uh, um, you know, the social media, um, you know, Instagram, and I can't even remember all the ones that have, that came and gone. Um, and now my young one, he's growing up with, you know, me, me and my wife, Sarah, we pick up our phone in the morning and, and, and it's like, he sees it and he's like, I want that too. You know, and um, it's really, really hard. Sarah and I have talked about it a lot about how it is. I mean, it's like being a smoker and then telling your kids not to smoke, you know, because our scrolling behavior is as addictive to us as it is to now this two-year-old kid who has no frame of reference or self-control in terms of, of that kind of stuff. And I, we see how it wears on his... Um, psyche just his desire to have screen time at age two you know and we try to really really limit it but you know we watch movies together we watch daniel tiger together we you know it's like we, we you know it's it's almost unavoidable when he sees us doing it right. you know yeah. and so man it's it's a it's a crazy time to be a human being and you know, the last question that I have for you is, you know, we, I ask everybody at the end of the show, what does it mean to you to be human? And then how do you stay human in this world that is, it feels to me at least like it's trying to suck the humanity out of us so much of the time. And then at other times I'm like, oh my God, wow, how beautiful is that, that people really do care or that people really do fumble and people really do make mistakes and people really are these organic beings that are part of nature you know how how do you define being human for yourself and how do you stay human how do you hold on to it 
Wow. And I would love to hear, you know, I, I wish this was, uh, I wish I could now like do the second hour and, and ask you all the questions I want to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear your answer to that I'll, question too. I'll, I'll be, I'll be on the reverb podcast, man. <laughs> That's it. We don't have one, but I'll create one just so we can hang out more and talk. I want to learn right. more about you. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a, that was honestly, that's funny. Cause that was a question I was going to ask you anyway. Like I was like, all right, I knew that, you know, I stay human is a big thing Yeah, but throughout your, your music. That's a big message from, from, from yeah. you. Um, so I am, I do, I do want to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, for me, you know, I think about groups of people and maybe this is just like my whole like psychological versus sociological. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing that always helps me return to that struggle that I was talking about with my son, I have for, yeah. for myself as well. And I'm probably modeling it um, yeah. is how do I, at times, especially these days, right? Like how do you um, feel good about humanity? And, mm-hmm. and, and the times that I feel best about humanity is when I think about individual humans um, and I think about my neighbors and I think about our, my kids, teachers, when I think about, um, you know, various leaders in the community that are, that are truly like people generally, it's, it's very easy to go, Oh, this whole, like there's, there's this tribalism thing that is kind of cooked into our evolution, unfortunately, because it no longer serves us. In fact, it's completely deleterious, but, but the, uh, is that, is that the right word? <laughs> it's completely bad for us. <laughs> um, <deleterious. It's> <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you know, and so, when I break it back down to like bringing the, my world and thinking about people within like a smaller situation, not even my bubble, but other yeah. bubbles, you know, it changes everything. And that's something that, especially here in Maine, you know, you don't have to drive far to, to get out of your bubble here in Portland, Maine. And, uh, and Lauren and I talk about this all the time. We're like we should like go live in that house and like, we should work at that paper mill for like four months and just like jump into that world and understand it. Um, and we talk about like, that should be a reality show <laughs> or something, you know, mm. but the idea of like, cause when you do put yourself in those smaller situations, you go, yeah, these are good people. Like people generally are good to each other. People are generally trying to do the right thing. Family matters. And, and I, no matter what your big political, thoughts are how you think the world should be it's 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 i think helpful to remember that generally it's coming from a good place mm-hmm. um ultimately like you may have to yeah. crack it down to the core to go right that they're you know where people are concerned about their safety about their families about their communities mm-hmm. um and so i think for me that's what staying human is on that level as far as to each other but then i also do think about our place in nature and not to forget that we're animals and that we Mm. are of nature and not separate from nature. And, and so then for me, staying human is, is getting back into those woods, just to to bring this full circle. Like when I was a little boy in New Jersey, like, and get into that micro level of stuff on the ground and and the veins and the leaves and, and the different, you know, textures of tree bark or whatever it is, it just grounds you back into right. Uh, this house is not my natural habitat. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for me, that's, you know, I, I'm here in Maine and we live 10 minutes away from a, a local surf spot. And I didn't surf before coming to me. I started to learn surfing to surf when I was 40, uh, which yeah. is great. And especially during the pandemic, it's been huge. And you know, sometimes I'll just, you know, because, uh, you know, it's cold. I, I, I surf all winter too. So I have this huge six, five millimeter <laughs> wetsuit but it's super buoyant and i'll just sometimes just roll off my board especially on a mellow day and just float and just be in it and of it and try to like picture myself as part of the abyss and just really let into it um physically and and on an emotional and spiritual level like fully um succumb to it and that always really helps me and reminds me to just like we are of all of this around us we're not separate from it yeah and that's what i love about you bro you inspire me in your philosophy, your music, what you do with Reverb, with Lauren. And uh, it's great to learn more about your life. And how can folks who either want to plug into Reverb or just want to hear Guster's music or see Guster somewhere alive, how can they get in touch or, or follow you guys? Uh, my phone number is now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <You go to, laughs> 
Uh, I mean, for Guster music stuff, go to Guster.com. You know, we are doing as much as we can during this pandemic. We are looking at, we haven't done an official live stream yet. I think Ryan and I have done a little individual stuff. I know Luke's been doing a bunch of recording. We have been meeting up. We all live in different states, so that's tricky. But there's new music coming. There's concerts coming too. Hopefully, you know, this summer there'll be some little blips and blops of wherever it can happen. And then we'll do some real touring next year. Um, so guster.com for that and on the socials and then for reverb, it's reverb.org. And yeah, please plug in. There's all sorts of stuff while we are very tour oriented. We're also doing a lot of work outside of touring, especially these days. It's, it's been actually a really good time for us to be looking at our work outside of concerts. Um, we have this climate campaign that we're really excited about called the music climate revolution. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's all about transforming our industry, but also then, you know, the typical reverb way, like using the, the cultural power of music to change governments, corporate entities, the general public sentiment towards the work we need to do to, to really turn this around. And, you know, we have 2030 is a big year that, that everyone's pointing to that we need to make drastic changes on. So please yeah. join the Music Climate Revolution. We're launching that this spring. Uh, in an official way, we've been doing it unofficially for a couple of years, and to uh, the, so far, the pilot phase of that has been very successful and very hopeful. So that's been exciting. Nice. Well, folks, we've been talking with Adam Gardner from Guster and the uh, co-executive director of Reverb. And man, it's been great to talk to you. And uh, I'm I'm really excited to to both be getting music live happening again, but to get the you know music revolution and environmental revolution you know to be really a part of people's lives and so that when we think of going to concerts we think of it as something that we can feel proud about and not something that we've got to go gosh i wish we were doing this better and now with this big gap that we've all had to really rethink things it's a time that both as fans and artists and and production companies and promoters around the company around the country and around the world that we can really retool the way that we think about touring and uh, so thanks for being with us today folks please go check out reverb and guster.com and thanks for being here on the stay human podcast thanks for having me michael this is great right on